Bruce, you must have something really good too. Of course I do. It's Bruce Danielson, and I guess I'm here to entertain you too. I, I'll just, I'll do it. Good afternoon and welcome to your Sioux Falls City Council informational meeting. Today is Tuesday, February 26th. We'll call this meeting to order. The first item up is Land Use Committee from Tuesday, February 19th. I know Councillor Kylie is not here today. Uh, Councillor Staley, myself, and uh, Selberg were uh, in attendance at that meeting. Um, uh, I'll just give a very high uh, overview. Um, or Councilor Knights, it can also Councilor Knights, it can also um, discuss his item that he presented. Um, there were two items on our land use meeting um, last time. Uh, we discussed um, shape places, shape Sioux Falls, and some changes to the ordinance and some clean up language, um, and just some adjustments through uh, shape places um, as we move forward. As you know, that was a uh, a large uh, change to the way and a plan uh, that we do. Rezoning and so what essentially it does is kind of just makes those incremental changes throughout the years of what we've learned uh, From the Planning Commission and so that was presented it is out there on video You are all welcome to watch it and reach out to Jason Beavers uh, who presented the second item uh, on that agenda was a proposal by uh, Councillor Greg Neitzert um, Greg if you are Councillor Neitzert if you want to just give a, a 10 second overview as far as uh, your proposal. Um, but again, it's out there for everyone to view uh, and recorded. Uh, Councilor Neitzert. Yeah, I would encourage everybody to go watch the video. It's a proposal to adjust the setbacks for uh, apartments when they're three stories in height and adjacent to lower density uses, single family, for example. Just makes a setback a little bit larger. Um, and that's kind of in in keeping with what citizens are telling us, but trying to do it in just a small way so that we don't um, stunt development of multifamily, which is really important as well. Great, thank you, Councillor Neitzert. Again, you can watch that video out there and feel free to reach out to Councillor Neitzert. Uh, he's worked with the administration with that as well as other um, people that have an interest from citizens to developers. Um, the next item is City Council open discussion. Any open discussion? Seeing none, we'll move to our first presentation, 2018 Fire Code Updates. Welcome, Fire Marshal Dean Lanier. Good afternoon, Council. Dean Lanier, Fire Marshal with Sioux Falls Fire Rescue. Glad to be here today to go through a few slides. We started off with about 600 pages worth of fire code. We got that condensed down in about 250 We've taken those 250 and turned them into the 18 slides that we'll present today. So hopefully, yes, hopefully we'll be able to uh, make some of this make sense. So. The review of the 2018 fire code, it does not include all of the modifications that have been made uh, in the 2018 fire code. Uh, many of the modifications that were made within this year's code are language changes, textual changes, things that don't exactly change the intent nor the uh, function of what happens day to day in the field. So we didn't take that and put it into today's uh, uh, summary, but we did include some change summaries and significance so that you can have an idea uh, more detailed of what we're talking about. Oh, it should work. Gotcha. Awesome. Thank you. The first modification is amending section 903.2.8 of fire sprinklers for R2 apartments with more than six dwelling units. I think. Uh, building official Butch Warrington talked to you about this previously. Um, as late as 2012, we had made a code interpretation here locally that uh, uh, apartment buildings didn't have to be sprinklered if they were segmented into the separate fire areas. Um, we find ourselves a bit out on an island with that interpretation statewide. So we are incorporating what the rest of the state has already done and ensuring that six units and above apartment buildings are being sprinklered. Uh, this is a bit of a change. This is a different 
uh, type of system. Uh, many of the contractors that we've had conversations with over the last six months were concerned that I was uh, forcing a system on them that would be on par with a six-story apartment building like you see across the street, across Dakota Avenue, uh, next to City Hall. That is not what we're doing. What we're doing is a very bare bones sprinkler system. Um, we've provided quite a bit of information and quite a bit good, good discussion with both contractors and developers. They all have been uh, provided opportunities to attend briefings where this was explained in detail. We've taken it to uh, the Multifamily Housing Association. I'm not going to speak on their behalf, but we've also taken to it the IRAB committee where they voted in support of this amendment. The next section of code that is amended for 2018 is the outdoor pallet storage. Uh, this is a new section of code that was added. Uh, the requirements for code are being added to sp specifically regulate the height limitations and the separation to buildings and separation between piles for outdoor pallet storage. Um, pallets are a very heavy fire load and if and when they ever do catch fire, they are a significant fire to get out. If there are not avenues cut in between them, it is almost like uh, fighting a fire that you're never going to catch up with. So it can cause significant damage in a short period of time. And this is where fire code is being implemented to try to provide some avenues uh, and widths between pallet uh, storages. So how it's, how it's uh, divided up on a parcel and then how close it can be to buildings and other surrounding uh, occupancies. Lockdown plans, I'm sure if you're watching the news these days, you see that there is a heightened concern about security within schools. One of the things that we're doing here locally that we're probably a little bit ahead of the power, co uh, uh, the power curve as far as safety within schools, our emergency management office is already doing this with lockdown plans and having an operations plan uh, for schools. So in many cases, we've already met these requirements. This is code finally catching up with the best practice for industry is. Refrigerants for lower flammability hazards. So for me to explain this without putting my hat on and I get a little bit too technical, um, there are new refrigerants that are out on the market now that were uh, put into the market that have lower flammability ratings than what common refrigerants were previous to the new ones being introduced to the market. Uh, that means that they're just a little bit less flammable than the priors. It doesn't mean that they won't ever catch fire because as you see, the word is still flammable. That means the properties of the gas still meet certain limitations. It doesn't mean that they're completely harmless. So there were new uh, requirements put on those so that they segment out a little bit differently. Fire pumps and riser rooms, this requirement is being uh, input it into the code to just address when and where exterior uh, fire pump rooms are being used where you have to access the fire pump room from an exterior position around the building. Um, that when and where those are required, there are certain requirements that have to be met. Uh, this only actually kicks in if it's actually required and there are only a few uh, businesses that actually even try to do this. Uh, in most cases, we're able to do it through an interior entrance, but in this case, the fire code is being uh, directive in, it, in uh, trying to have some requirements of if it's an exterior entrance, what things have to be there. Integrated fire protection system testing. Um, this is a requirement to ensure that when there are multiple systems uh, that are required by fire code to operate within a building, that they all work integrated. That would seem obvious, but in many cases, these systems are quite complex. The one example that I can give to you right off the top of my head is the event center. The event center is an extremely complex system that operates on multiple different uh, bases, not only from air management to fire alarm system itself to detection within the building, all the way down to the sprinkler system. It is more than just a few things coming together to make sure that that system operates as designed. So what this code requirement is, is ask, making sure that when they're tested, all of those systems are tested as an integrated system, not going and test just one single element of it and another single element, but never test them in concert with each other to make sure that they collaborate and work effectively together. 
aerosol fire extinguishing systems. This is specifically for care facilities where, uh, where people in the building are capable of self-preservation but may be under care in some other way. Uh, it intentionally requires automatic suppression on, ki on kitchen stoves so that they have some level of protection for a domestic cooking that they might do on a range. Aerosol uh, fire extinguishing systems are something new to the market, uh, very cost effective and effective with regards to grease fires on top of stoves. Group R4 fire alarm systems. I'm probably gonna cause you to sit back in your seat a little bit because this is actually a deletion from code. It is taking out the requirement for a fire alarm system in a group R4 occupancy. It is no longer required. Uh, it is very similar to other types of apartment living, but in this instance, fire code officials are absolutely agreeing that this is the right thing to do and just take it out and not require a fire alarm system in this type of occupancy anymore. Group R3 apartments and Group R4 living arrangements protected by a 13 domestic system have been allowed to use in this new code a new access travel distances. So in most cases, they've been increased about 25% for most, uh, most of these structures. Um, but it does allow, if you sprinkler a building, it allows additional egress path for somebody to get out of the building. Uh, going back to schools again, this has been a long standing issue that has come across the state's radar quite a few times and Sioux Falls here locally quite a few times. Uh, there's con a lot of concern about security inside schools. Uh, this requirement just provides guidance for schools about door lock sets. Um, there has been a myriad of solutions being offered to local uh, school districts and schools as means to secure their property. Uh, to allow them to secure their students while they're in class. Um, this opens a lot of different options to them, all from card swipes to key punches on down the road. Um, the intent here was really to, and, and the focus really should be on the last sentence within this paragraph, that the outside of the classroom, uh, you can control ingress and egress through that oh, as, as long as you want. But consistent with tradition, the door may be locked with a key as long as it, when, you, when you go through it, all you have to do is hit a handle and go through the door. So th there are a lot of different circumstances in schools where they want security both inside and out. They want to be able to allow kids to go out to the bathroom but come back and not be locked out. This allows them to do that based on whatever locking mechanism they choose and puts options on the table for them to do that. Again, probably going to surprise you, fire sprinklers and existing A2 occupancies, we are not adopting this section. This section has to do with an existing building chapter and the requirement for fire sprinklers inside bars and restaurants with 300 or more occupants. Um, at this point, we're not quite, I, I know what the intent was behind this to try to ensure that these bars and restaurants were sprinklered in the first place. Um, we wanted time to go back and even check to see if we had any bars or restaurants that even met this requirement in the first place, because we're not exactly sure that this would even apply to anyone within our jurisdiction. Um, once we adopt it, then we kind of have to enforce it. Uh, so we were hesitant about doing that first uh, without knowing what kind of impact that was gonna have on our community without first knowing who would be subject to these kind of changes. So in that section, we are gonna go back and look at it. If there is a change in thought process towards that, and we think that it's a necessary component to a fire code adoption, then we'll bring it back to you. Energy systems, uh, one of the things that's been uh, new to the market in the past five to six years is the uh, influence of uh, energy systems within any type of different occupancies from residential to business. Um, many of them are using solar voltaic panels, uh, backup power systems of multiple different batteries inside uh, a building to have backup power in case of emergency. 
and in some cases, uh, generator power. But in each of those cases, the, the fire code is requiring that there is a rapid shutdown for, for any of those energy systems within, within a building. The reason why that's so, so important is because all of that, uh, all of those en energy systems operate off of high voltage. Obviously, we don't want firefighters trying to figure out in a dark building which lever to pull in case of an emergency. Protection from vehicle impact. This is a, a new code requirement. What it does provide is for the fire code official to be able to uh, look at gas stations and fuel stations within their jurisdiction, decide whether or not the dispensers that actually dispense fuel into cars are subject to vehicle impact uh, and maybe too close to uh, uh, traffic flow within the area. Um, it is something that we're looking at. I don't have a top five list off the top of my head that I can give you that we, we may look at uh, a couple of buildings or a couple of dispenser uh, gas stations here in the city. Um, but I do know we've had several incidents where uh, dispensers have ended up in streets. We've had running fuel fires out into streets. Uh, and those are the kind of instances that this specific code was intended for so that you don't have that issue of uh, a vehicle just swerving off a road and suddenly hitting a dispenser and then everything is out into the street. Repair of vehicles for uh, compressed natural gas and liquid natural gas. These are new requirements because of new technologies coming into the market. Um, there are more and more uh, fleet vehicles being run and operated off of compressed natural gas and liquid natural gas. This just adds repair maintenance requirements for those repair shops. Food truck requirements. Uh, this, again, I'm probably going to set you back a little bit. This is not being adopted. It is a new uh, change to code. Um, there is already a license issued by PD. Um, we are, again, going to review these requirements and see if there are things in there that are important that we think should be adopted. And if so, we will bring them back to your attention at a later time. But at this point, uh, the requirements don't make a distinction whether they're new or existing food trucks. Uh, so it's a little bit arbitrary for us to jump into that water without knowing uh, what was the exact intent of code, it being a new requirement from the start. Temporary special event structures. I'm sure you're well aware of events that we have around town during the summertime from uh, golf tournaments to the Jazz Fest. When those events happen, we're normally seeing large tent structures inside of those. The code has changed some language so that temporary stage and canopy has been folded into the definition of temporary special event structure. The terminology has changed uh, within code, but the intent behind it is to kind of have an umbrella where all tent structures and, and stage canopies and all the rest can all kind of be covered under one uh, section of code. Um, it is bringing some new requirements in for, uh, for tents. Basic things, though, like the fact that the tent, the tent itself has been tested and is stamped uh, by the testing agency that it is approved for use. Those basic requirements uh, are things that we look for now anyways. Subdevelopment within uh, road widths. Um, there's a change to subdevelopments to 28 feet. This is to maintain consistency with the subdevelopment ordinance. Uh, when and where it's required, we will require street widths to be 28 feet. And that is just to maintain that consistency. Questions for me? Any questions for Mr. Lanier, Councilor Sale? Dean, uh, a few slides ago, you talked about aerosol fire and the requirements for automatic fire suppression in domestic cooking systems and care. Could you elaborate a little bit for, more for me on that, please? So these are aerosol-based systems. So similar to uh, today, you could probably go into almost any hard st hardware store and find uh, fire extinguishers that are actually little aerosol cans. Um, kind of new technology. hasn't been out very long, but it's similar technology to that. It disrupts the, the uh, ability for the, for the fire to continue to grow. 
breaks up the chemical reaction. Um, but it is a much, cost, much more cost-effective alternative to a wet chemical system that dumps something on top of the fire. This just sprays this, uh, this what, for lack of a better term, an, an aerosol can at it and puts it out that way. Uh, are, are these existing care facilities, uh, that's probably more of my question on what, where are these located at? These would be, these would be for our new construction. New construction. Yeah. Okay, that's I. Yep. Any other questions, Councilor Nitzer? Besides the fact that it's just a big stack of wood, why are pallets so flammable? Chemicals or? I'm sorry. I'm what, sorry. I mean, besides the fact that pallets are a big stack of wood, why why are they so flammable? Is there something special they're, they're about combustible, them? They're uh, combustible, but I would tell you that the reason why they burn so well is because of the nature of how they're constructed and how they're oriented. So there's air gaps in between all the pallets. Um, the wood is generally dried out. Um, you have wood that has dimensional width less than an inch and a half, uh, so it just burns really well. Got it. Okay. Uh, probably the preferred wood of anybody starting a fire pit outside that has a large fire pit. Okay. Um, and then in relation to uh, addition to section 1103.5.1, which was the retrofit of fire sprinklers in bars and restaurants with more than occupancy of 300, if you were to adopt that, would that be something that would be uh, where on a yearly inspection you would say, okay, you've got to do this? Or would that be upon a new building permit? When would that trigger? So that is a retroactive requirement, which would touch every existing restaurant if they met those requirements, those, that description. 300 more occupants in your bar or restaurant. That's, that's some of the reason why we're concerned about it is because we don't know exactly how many of them are out there, but we also are not absolutely sure uh, if there are any in the first place. Um, we've generally done a good job in the past of making sure that bars and restaurants get sprinkler protected. Uh, so to, to adopt something that we'll have to enforce before we even know what the impact is, I'm not exactly sure that would be uh, in, in yeah, Something agreed. That would be effective. We don't we don't know the how many and what the cost and all no. that. Uh, as far as the gas station issue, yes. Are, are we talking? Would you be? I mean, could there be? They might have to put up more bollards around gas exactly pumps and all kinds about. of things. Um, and, and, we and can put when? bollards in front of them. Uh, there, there's several different options for bollards, whether they're U-shaped or whether they're single bollards that stick up out of the ground. Um, probably wouldn't go anything different than that because of space but we would do our best to make sure that the, the uh, dispensers themselves are protected from vehicle or traffic. With, um, I'm sure as you drive around the city, you've seen several gas stations that, are, that, are, that have been in the city a long time, but are very proximate to the curb. Um, those are the situations that we're most concerned about, but we really only take a serious look at them if they've already had a history of dispensers being rolled out into the street. Um, people driving off with the, with the hoses, that kind of thing. If, if they're not subject to that kind of damage and that kind of circumstance, then we probably wouldn't enforce this section of code on them. Well, if, if it's a gas station that might be newer with long, bigger setbacks, yeah. would that be enforced or is it gonna be more for a gas station where it's only the, a pump is 10 feet off the property line. It would only, we would only use it for those circumstances in which the pumps were in very close proximity to the, to the right of way. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Councillor Staley. <clears throat> I got a few questions. Uh, <coughs> this is kind of a, you didn't cover this, Dean, but um, in, in the past, I know we've offered uh, like free smoke detectors for residential areas. Are, are we still doing that? Yes, ma'am. Do do we ever do a push for fire extinguishers in a home? Now, I, I know you were talking with Councillor Sale about a, some kind of a spray fire extinguisher in an aerosol can. Yeah, the, the, the system that uh, Councillor Staley was, or Councillor Sale, I'm sorry, was referring to was for a, directly above a kitchen stovetop mm -hmm. inside a care facility. Mm -hmm. So the building has a senior care facility inside of it and it's independent living. Mm -hmm. uh, for those kind of circumstances where there is a, um, 
there is a combined area where cooking can be done. Uh, those are the circumstances under which for new construction, that type of system could be used as an option for suppression. But is that a, something you, you're holding on to? Is it a type of fire extinguisher? Uh, it would be permanently installed over the kitchen, over the kitchen uh, stovetop itself. Okay, so back to the residential thing. Okay. Do we encourage people to have a fire extinguisher in their home? Is that sent out to people like in the water bill? And, and or do we ever offer incentives to help people buy fire extinguishers? We give quite a bit of uh, information out to the public about what should be in a home for home fire safety. We talk about things like extinguishers and having them. Um, to, be, to be perfectly honest, what we recommend to folks is, if you're gonna buy an extinguisher, take the time to read the instructions on the extinguisher, because that's probably the most important thing about using it, is reading the instructions. Uh, I think most people get uh, a little bit upset when they buy an extinguisher and it doesn't exactly work as, uh, as uh, as described. I understand you're in a panic then and if, yeah. you, if you're trying to figure it out at the time. Yeah. But so, so we, we do have, uh, we still do programs for uh, smoke alarms. We also install uh, carbon monoxide uh, alarms as well for homes. Uh, but we also recommend to homeowners if they are in the market for doing that, that an extinguisher that can be used for kitchen, uh, basic combustibles around the house. Uh, uh, typically it's a What's called an ABC extinguisher is recommended. ABC. Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. I'm good. Uh, I've got another question. Now, um, now you're talking about those uh, six plexes uh, uh, having to right is it, my six dwelling units, six plex. Um, what is the multi housing association saying about this? Because uh, I'm kind of getting the feeling. I'm, you, I'm not gonna try to. Uh, define what their thoughts are about it. I would suffice it to say that all of this information has presented has been presented to them. Um, our meetings have been positive, uh, but I don't want to speak on their behalf as far as what their opinion is on. Okay, on and that and subject. just to just I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but there's many times when we have things come before us, and I'll say to the department head, how does that industry feel? And they're able to say, oh yeah, got to buy in with them, there's no problem. So you're not saying that to me. What I am so, saying is this information has been presented to them. Um, I, I think they've taken it to their body and at least discussed it uh, internally, but I don't want to stand here and presume that I have the... I, okay, I get that, thank you. So going back to, I, I'm Grandpa Joe. I own a sixplex since 1958. Do I have to, if we pass this, are they going to have to put a sprinkler system in? No, ma'am. The requirements are only for new construction. Um, consistent with what we talked about in one of the earlier slides about retrofitting buildings with sprinklers. Uh, I think within our department, we, we've kind of, we've, We've been hesitant about trying to go into buildings and retrofit buildings with sprinklers uh, when there's nothing else being done. Realistically, if you're going to do a sprinkler system correctly, you basically need to tear the building apart. Okay. So it is not a realistic expectation that you're just going to easily go in and slap some pipes in and have a sprinkler system. Okay. So I would th so the Home Builders Association probably would have something to say about this as well, since they're. But That's, I mean, at some at some point. That is not our intent. Any okay. any sprinkler requirements are for new construction. Okay. Good. I got a few more, but I can. If somebody else has. Councilor Brecky. Councilor Staley, we'll come back to you after that. <clears throat> the uh, food trucks. What what is currently you know, being checked on, you know, by the police department and, you know, what, you know, you said you, said you were going to look into that maybe later. What, what, what are you looking for? What are you looking at on that issue? So the real threat from food trucks is the uh, fact that they use propane or natural gas as their fuel for cooking inside the fuel truck. The biggest concern that we have 
if they have grease-laden vapors inside the fuel truck itself from cooking, the collection of those grease-laden vapors and them catching fire. The other concern that we have is that the piped gas is still serviceable and not leaking. Uh, gas does what it wants, and, and most people are not exactly uh, ready for the effects of how gas reacts under pressure when it finally does catch fire. So those are our principal concerns, but we want to make sure that within those concerns are being addressed within those code requirements, and we have ways to enforce that. Um, so if somebody bought a food truck, I have little say about how it was constructed. Once they buy it, it's pretty much a done deal. We would expect them to pipe it uh, according to a standard, but there's not a whole lot of information out there about how these food trucks are being piped internally with their gas lines. So that's one of the areas where, where we're not exactly sure of what the outcome is going to be, so we'd rather research it and find out exactly what's going on before we start making code requirements. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions? Otherwise, we'll go to Councillor Staley. Councillor Staley, go ahead. Um, then uh, another question had to do with the pallet issue. Um, can you uh, explain what, what, as it is now, what's the requirement for the pallets? There's not a whole lot. There's not a whole lot in the existing code now that would address the outdoor storage of pallets, and, plastic or wooden. And have you, like, talked with different businesses that are actually involved? I, I have no idea how. To my knowledge, we only have one in town. It's located up in our industrial park. Um, well, because I thought there were other businesses kind of have pallets laying around in the backyard. Yeah, and some of them have incidental storage. Uh, but when, when I start talking about uh, more than incidental storage, more than just a, a, a driveway filled with some pallets. Okay, so that, that's not going to be affected. No. Uh, separation distances from buildings will be enforced, but the, the pallet, the, the size of what you can store on a driveway typically is not the kind of thing that we're talking about here with these outdoor pallet storage so, areas. So what, what is the business that... We're, we're talking more about parking lots that are filled with... Uh, pallets. And is it their business to have pallets, or are yes, they just... They're, they're there is pallet. one. I uh, don't know what the name of the business is off the top of my head. So what, what are they going to have to do? Uh, principally, it's going to be separation distances and drive lanes between the, uh, the storage packages. So if you have an area that's 50 by 50, 50 feet by 50 feet of pallets stored at 20-foot elevation, there'd have to be some distance in between that packet of uh, pallets and the next one right next to it. Um, there's, a, there's a 10 to 12 foot separation distance in between them and that would be required for every one of those 50 by 50 foot uh, squares. So just, just to make sure that this doesn't spill onto just this property owner who has the transitional pallet thing, uh, how, <coughs> and let's say they have those, are, they, are you going to say to that business that's just has a few around, are you going to say that it has to be a certain space between that and the building? And let's say their parking lot isn't big enough, what is that space going to be? Um, if, their, if their parking lot is not big enough, we'll work with them on dwindling their inventory of pallets down to, a, to an area where it's not going to be such a risk. Um, Normally, we get into issues with storage, outdoor storage, with all types of different things that may not exactly, off the top of your head, you may not think they're very hazardous, but storage of tires, um, whether they're small or whether they're large industrial tires, are just as much a heavy concern as th storing things like pallets. So we do work with businesses around the city when they have non-compliant storage on the outside of their building. We work with them to get them back into compliance. Okay, and is there a fine entailed in, in if you would say? Uh, to be honest, Councillor Staley, um, I'm, I, I work through the process. I, I think if you talk to commercial businesses around the city um, about how fire prevention engages them, talks to them about what needs to be corrected, why it needs to be corrected, um, what kind of risks they're assuming if it's not corrected, I think you'll find that many of those folks find 
that what we're asking for is just common sense type of approaches. Mm -hmm. um, we have a very, very low rate of citations issued. Um, but it sounds, I'm hearing you say at the beginning of our conversation, this is only impacting a big group of this business who has a lot of pallets, that it really wasn't aimed to go towards the person with, what'd you say, how'd you say the word? Transit? Incidental storage it's of pallets. Incidental, yeah. yeah. Okay, and then one other question um, about the gas station thing. I, I, I guess I hadn't even. What did you call those, uh, Councilor Nicer? Ballards. Ballards. Ballard. I never, never heard of. But that, that's the thing you knock your door against when you're opening it up to get out of the. Uh, that's what's knocking right, the against wind your takes, door. Well, yeah, it's always like that. It's, yeah, right. Okay. That's exactly. So, so I, <laughs> I thought every every gas station had that. They don't. They they do have. Okay, so. In the, in the lane of travel, they will have them at either end. Um, the problem is, is that has not been enough protection in a couple of different instances throughout the city of Sioux Falls. Mm -hmm. In that we've had cars drive over the dispensers despite the, the bollards being at either end. Mm -hmm. um, we've had delivery trucks of gasoline drive over the dispensers even though they're protected by bollards. So what the intent of code is, is where the code official sees a, a, just a repeat incident, and we have some of those, where dispensers are continuously getting ripped off their, uh, off their base, that you can require the business to put some additional protection to prevent Well, I would think the happening. business would want to, yeah. right, because they're having to recover. It, it, it doesn't, it, it really would be a cost savings for them, because the reinstalling of that is, is got to cost quite a bit of money. So it would just be common sense for them to, to, to put something in to protect their, their investment. Okay, thanks. I'm going to go to Councillor Starr and then I'll come back to you, Councillor Natser. Go ahead, Councillor. Great, thank you. Um, I'm impressed that you take a look at what, before we in, um, initiate a new code or a new way of doing something that we know the full impact before we do that. So know that we appreciate that. I did sit back in my chair and I was surprised, but it was good. I appreciate that part of it, I guess. But one of the things that we've spent a lot of time as a community and probably as a, as a nation, we spend a lot of time talking about affordable housing. And I never want to put safety ahead of what something costs or what it does. But at the same time, we have to balance what how safe we can keep people with if they can't even afford to be in the building. So we're really keeping them safe by not being there or not being able to build those housing units. And I know our friends in the, the home building industry, you know, balance some of those costs. Is that part of the consideration when you're looking at new codes? I mean, how do you balance that? Like I said, I don't want to balance safety with um, cost, but I have to. And so how do we as a regulating body do that? So That's council, as philosophical counselor, as I get on Hopefully I can explain it this way. So uh, we both have kids. Uh, one, of the, one of the decisions we have to make is allowing them to drive. Uh, probably the most scary decision we have to make. And a decision that has to be made of, you know, what's the, what's the maintenance on the car that you're going to allow them to drive? Um, where I chose to spend my money on, on cars was in tires, brakes, and things that actually affected the safety of them driving, I would say if you can make a, uh, a correlation between that and the safety that are provided to buildings, you're on the right track. Uh, I'm not a proponent of trying to throw every brand new safety feature into a building. I think we owe the community testing that concept out, making sure it's functional and it works. Um, to be honest, I don't think anybody sees the difference between a fire alarm or sprinkler system that doesn't operate effectively and the fire marshal. So when it goes off and it's wrong, it's the fire marshal's fault. I see my job as diminishing those occurrences, not increasing them. So I want to make that sure that the technology that we're putting into buildings and the safety features and functions that we are putting into them really work and function in the way that they're intended to. It's an awesome answer. Thank you. That's exactly what I was looking for. Councilor Nather. Not to belabor the pallet issue, but just to follow up a little bit. So 
just to be really clear, having thinking about in a previous life working at, at you know it places in retail and unloading trucks. Just about every retail establishment of some size yeah. has truck deliveries. You're unloading the pallets. You open up the side door. You stack the pallets on the side of the building. The pallet guy comes the next day and he takes them. Yeah. So, I mean, so like if you got 12 stacked up and they're right up against the grocery store, are those in, in question here? No, we're talking about the large. We're, and then, we're, we're talking about dimensions of 50 by 50 feet and larger. And okay, so then how about when you're talking about if you go to, let's say, one of the large home improvement stores, and in their outdoor area, they might have huge piles of pallets with all kinds of fertilizers and yeah. whatever else. Is that in play? Or are we just talking bare pallets? Actually, when they, when they stock and they put those pallets into an area, normally it's out in the middle of nowhere. They centralize them in a specific spot, and that's the end of the story. Um, we, we don't see a whole lot of inventory just being stocked in huge, large uh, uh, packets like what we're talking about with this. Uh, I think they're, the, the volume and scale is what we're talking about. That's a little bit different. Incidental storage for any type of commercial business, big box store, you may have a couple of hundred, couple of thousand of them. Here we're talking about tens of thousands. Wow, okay. Yeah. But even like a like the big warehouse is like a cold storage facility that has, you know, out at Foundation Park. I mean, are they in most of those cases? They already have the area sprinkled both inside and outside. So if you visit your local hardware store, uh, one of the big local uh, hardware stores, you'll find that if you go into their wood section, those areas are sprinkler protected as well. Oh, okay. And then, just out of curiosity, I've just been you know you, you kind of think about. How much of a difference has it made in fire prevention when you look at a newer house, like you look at a house like mine where I've got arc fault circuit interrupters on, you know, the kitchen and bedrooms and all these things. And then, you have, of course, GFCI and all of these. And then you compare that to an older home, which may not have any of that. It might be on fuses. You might have older wiring. I mean, I, how often do we, do you have things like, I mean, electrical fires in a newer home? Is it? It, I, without, without, so this is completely off the top of my head. So my gut reaction to that question is generally elect, electrical systems operate to the ex, as well as the extent in which they were installed. So there were, if there was really good care and, uh, by the installer, then you have a tendency that they are going to operate well over a long period of time. To be honest, Counselor, we still have knob and tube in the city of Sioux Falls. Um, BC Mike Top is sitting over there who's in charge of investigations for the city. I'm sure he would tell you there are probably more than just a few homes where knob and tube has been, let's say, spliced into modern wiring, which is not supposed to happen, but it has been done. And often those systems operate and function well up until a point of which something changes. They, they put in some high current, plug some high current space heater in or something and it overloads? Or? Put a penny in the bus and screw it in real hard to keep it from tripping the circuit breaker. Uh, it doesn't really function like it's supposed to. Oh, anymore. sure. So, yeah, that's not uncommon. Or probably homeowner pulled permits and they think that they're electrical experts and then they do the wiring of the downstairs basement and it's a little... Getting, getting the installation right is probably the key mechanism to whether or not it will function well and function well for years. Great, thanks. Yep. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I'll, Councillor Saley, uh, we'll go to you next. I just want to remind the council that we have to be done at 445 and we do have to allow for public comment and we have one more presentation. So go ahead. How do you spell that baller thing, baller? B-O-L-L-A-R-D. B-O-L-L, -L -L. thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right, thank you, Mr. Lanier, appreciate it. Any councillors have additional questions, feel free to reach out to Dean. He's always great at getting back to us. Um, appreciate your time here, and uh, you may hear from a few of us. Thank you. The next item we'll move to is the final design and construction uh, administration agreement, Sherman Park Improvements. Director Don Kearney, thank you for being here. Again, I'll just remind everyone that we do have to allow for public comment. Uh, if there is no public comment, we can continue to go, but we have to be done at 445. Thank you, go ahead. 
Thank you. Good, good afternoon, City Council members. Um, a few weeks ago, there was a request for uh, the staff to come back and present the, uh, some more background information on the structural analysis on the Buffalo Wall uh, that we're looking to uh, uh, come up with a design uh, to uh, replace that wall and incorporate art uh, and the artist's uh, vision for that uh, particular wall uh, into the overall concept. And so with us today is Robbie Verink. Uh, Robbie's with Midwest Engineering. Uh, he uh, performed the structural analysis on the wall and then uh, towards the end of his presentation, we'll also talk about how we will uh, seek to kind of honor the history of the wall that, that's there uh, now and also uh, try to come up with some unique ways to uh, really do a good job on, uh, you know, preserving the history and the nostalgia of the wall itself. So with that, I'd have Robbie come up and uh, lead you through their presentation. Thank you. Welcome, Robbie. If you can just state your first and last name for the record. <clears throat> Excuse me. Council, I'm Robbie Verink. I'm a structural engineer with Midwest Engineering, and I was the one who performed the structural analysis on uh, Buffalo Wall after the collapse. And so I'm going to try to do a quick 10,000 foot level discussion of what we found and kind of where we want to go from here, and then give you guys an opportunity to ask any questions. Um, if you're not aware of where the Buffalo Wall is located at, it's just south of the zoo, I believe on Indian Mound Street. And so it's about 160 feet long and about 12 foot eight tall at the height. <coughs> and it has a couple small wings that veer off from it. On the weekend of March 24, 2018, the city plow operator noted that the wall had fallen and notified city officials. The failure occurred at the horse and rider interface on the scenic part of it. And from that point on, barriers and a fence were put up to protect the public. The failure investigation occurred on April 11th. City staff, I believe it was street, the street department provided an excavator and an operator. And Matt Thompson from Geotech, a geotechnical engineer, and myself were on site that day. And basically the intent behind that day was to determine what materials were used to build the wall, measurements of you know rock behind the wall, rock weight, and so forth. As with any type of investigation, we had our basis of design or to analyze the wall consisted of geotech's recommendation for soil bearing capacity for the wall and the existing loads that acted on the back of the wall. For analysis of the wall, we utilized a rock redesign manual that was published by the Federal Highway Administration for use through design of walls such as this. Well, results of the investigation, the current wall was structurally inadequate and re required significant changes to make it meet minimum design standards. Some of these changes would require making the maximum wall height approximately seven foot tall and then basically redoing the water flow behind the wall to make it adequately drain away from it. And one of the major components would be we would have to remove the artistic component from the wall. This, the art scenes create discontinuity in the structure. And as you can see, the original photo, that was where the failure occurred. So we would have to remove that component from it. We'd also have to address some frost depth issues on the foundation of the wall. and. Due to the nature of this type of construction, we'd have to develop a pretty detailed construction technique for how the rocks interlock because with a wall like this, you're requiring on the friction between the rocks to move the load of the wall down to its base. So where do, you, where do we go from here knowing that? So the existing wall is not going to work without significant changes. We also know that the city of Sioux Falls requires building permits or engineering for walls over four foot. And so initially our discussion were concrete walls or a segmented block wall, kind of like a monster block or recon block wall. And those discussions were had just initially with respect to cost and availability. 
And so if we were to proceed forward with design, you know, we would have different considerations that we'd have to discuss. One would be public safety. We need a wall that's gonna be structural, structurally safe for the citizens of Sioux Falls. Two, we would try to retain that existing rock on the Buffalo wall for future use or retain it in a public or at a city of Sioux Falls own property. Obviously, we would wanna build a wall as most cost effective as we could. And from a construction timeline, you know, this wall's been down for approximately a year. I think we would like to see the wall go under construction this year and be completed. And then we would also like to incorporate some level of art into this wall moving forward. So the next steps where we'd like to go from here is we'd like to start design this spring. Basically, we would want to address, you know, public safety is our number one goal for the project. We would continue the conversations with the original wall artist and explore options to potentially utilize portions of the wall that are existing for future use. And then obviously what I stated before too is we would want to retain all the rock that was in the original wall as city property or reutilize it. From there, once we had that all put together, we'd put together construction plans and specifications and hopefully go into construction this summer. Any questions? Thank you for your presentation. Councilor Sale. Thank you, Robbie. Uh, you talked about the Rocky design and construction guidelines by the Federal Highway Administration. Were these guidelines in place when the original wall was built? Do you know how new they are? I do not know offhand when it was established. I believe it was in the 1990s, and I don't know if that manual was used when this wall was built. Thank you. Any other questions, Councillor Starr? Yes, uh, thank you. I guess my, my concern is how would you see our, the contract that we're going to approve? Is that with your company to go into the design standards or who received the bid? We would put together plans and specifications to go out for a public bid to build the project. To build the project, but you have to design the project yep. first is what we're approving or what we'll be approving on the 5th. Of yep. March, so and we and no decisions have been made at this point of what direction we're going, or what type of wall it would be. Right, but that's in the contract that we're approving yep. that we're hiring your firm to do that design. I guess is my yep, question to do just design. Gotcha. That's it for that part of it for me. Any other questions, Councilor Brecky? Um, and maybe this is questions premature because you're in the design process, but are you familiar with the design, or the, the dry stack technique that was used on this wall? The, the rockery design, or the rockery design, is that what you're asking, if we're familiar with it? Yeah, and you, the, you know, the actual creation, you know, of the buffaloes chasing, you know, is used a dry, dry stack technique, meaning there's no mortar and it's kind of an ancient technique um, and I'm just wondering what your familiarity is, because my concern here is about this monster block. Um, I'm glad that to see that you're going to be talking to the artist, because I'm hoping that you won't design something that won't be able to incorporate that technique into it, because it's two separate techniques, and I don't know how they work together. Yep, we, we have had discussions with Mr. Porter about this prior to meeting today. And if we were to utilize the stone wall, we would most likely use it as a facade to a primary structural wall. So we could retain these scenes, this art, and it would be on the front of a structural wall behind it that would not be visible. And we would go about it that way. The, going to your earlier question, the rockery, a rockery design wall is not typical out in this call it neck of the woods. Um, it's the same design principles behind like a segmented block wall. You, you have to design the wall to resist overturning, sliding, and bearing capacity. And so it's very similar to the, the same concepts. It's just the, the devil's really in the details between the difference between the two. And you have talked to the artist about that because again, he is a, truly an expert on 
dry stack. And yep. I happened to negotiate the original contract, and I learned more about dry stack in that than I ever thought I would. So I actually still retain a little bit of knowledge about it. But I do know it's a unique technique that, when done properly, can last for thousands of years. And there's no mortar in it, which is just strange. Um, strange. But I'm just wondering about you know, what he thinks about building that into a monster block wall as opposed to into, you know, the side of the, of the, of the mound. And you, you're saying that he's saying he thinks that could work? Because he would know. Yep. And, you know, again, we haven't finalized any design or where it's going, but we have had those discussions. And in order, you know, with the scenery, the discontinuities that are created by having those different type of rocks that form the art, would really create a structural challenge where it would be easier just to provide a structural wall behind that and treat this like you would a traditional building where the brick facade would be attached to the structural block wall behind it. So we could utilize the same rock without making significant changes to it to and go forward in that direction if that was the direction it went. I just, I would encourage you to continue to work hand in glove with the artist because he truly is an expert on this. Um, it sounds like it makes sense to me, but then I don't know that much about either technique and I'm just wondering about merging the two together is what I'm concerned about. Yep. Councilor Selberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Is there an estimate how long it's gonna take to build this once the design's approved or will that depend a lot on what the it design would, actually would, is? It would really be determined by the direction that the design went. If we're gonna incorporate different types of construction, whether it be casting place concrete behind a rockery wall with, you know, it's gonna have a longer timeline than it would if we just quick threw up a block, segmented block wall. So, um, Preliminarily, we did discuss it, but you know, it's kind of up in the air of what direction it goes. Could be a month, could be three months, or just. I would th think we would be able to do it in under three months, yeah. Okay, but the goal is to have this all done start to finish by the end of the summer, right? Yep, uh, there were some discussions about hopefully having completion of the wall before the Sanford Classic, which I believe was in the middle of September, September but I could I think. be incorrect yep. with that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Madam Chair. Go ahead, Councilor Chair. Actually, I had probably a question for the artist. I see he's here. If Mr. Williams um, wouldn't mind answering a question or two as we move forward in this process, or <laughs> if you don't want to, you don't have to. I... You're here. We might as well get right to the. I think Councillor Brecky did a, a nice job of pointing out that uh, as this process moves forward, the intent of the council by uh, putting this in the CIP was to, to make sure that we um, keep in mind your artistic vision of, of the sculpture of, of what you did in this process 16, 17 years ago. Are you comfortable where we're at and how we're moving forward with this? Somewhat, yes, I am comfortable with uh, how it's moving forward, but um, you know, I still have a few questions with the engineer um, about um, how they would incorporate my artwork into the wall. Um, I'm just afraid that I'm being left out of the process. So that's all. Um, like today. Um, I didn't know about this whole thing that was happening today, um, and they kind of left me out of it. But I did, you know, get it on in time. Um, I I really don't know what to say, to tell you the truth. Yeah. Councilor Brecky. Yeah, and I'm going to you know ask that question of you because again, knowing what I learned from you years ago about dry stack, and you know just you know kind of sort of just seeing the use of monster block all over the city and how you know there's there's some issues with it. You know it pops out pretty fast and they dye it and the dye goes away in about three years. And I'm just you know wondering your thoughts initially about the ability to merge the two together. Because it makes sense to me, the idea of a stronger wall to be kind of the frame for the artwork, but I, I want to know your opinion on that. And maybe you can't give one right now. Maybe you need more information. But that's the question I kind of have for you going into this. Um, you know, it would really be difficult to, um, 
to build that wall into a monster block wall or to lay it up in front of a monster block wall. It would be a good, um, um, I don't know if it'd be cost, uh, it costs a lot of money to do it. Um, but it is possible. It depends on the, the design and uh, I'm willing to work with them on a design to incorporate that piece of work in it. The only thing that bothers me is that them taking down the wall, you know, to get it down. I know that we'd have to take it down to save the rock. In other words, they're going to just knock it over with a backhoe and uh, throw it in a pile, like has been suggested to me by the Parks Department, that they'd put it in a pile and save the stone. <laughs> if you don't know what you're doing to take down the wall, you're going to destroy the, the pieces that, of buffalo and the rest of the Native American on the horse. They've already uh, damaged uh, quite a bit of the artwork by the street department. And uh, I would like for them to think about um, utilizing us to take it down and to save it. Because if you'll notice on that wall, it's in coursing. Um, uh, we use different size stone all the way across in the wall. And if you just knock it over and tip it in a pile, um, somebody has to go through and, and sort all that rock out to be able to uh, reconstruct the same design. And, and it would probably break up the, the images. Thank you. Councilor Neitzer, did you have a question? I do have a few for staff, if, if that would be okay. Thank you, Mr. Williams. The, I guess the first thing I would say, and, and this is with all respect, this is just kind of the lay of the land. I, I really, I really love what was what was there, but I honestly really don't know what the intent of the council was because this wasn't anything we voted on the change. There was a, a wording change. I think that was maybe at the request of a councilor, which I give him credit for looking into it and dealing with it. But I don't, I don't really remember much. I, I guess I don't even know what, what the, whether we were trying to preserve the intent of the artist or of the artwork, and so that's unclear to me, so I'm not sure exactly where we're going. That's more of just a statement. Um, help me with, I guess I'm a little confused. Okay, so if we might go with the, this wall idea is uh, of the structural block wall, um, would there be, are we still talking about doing a call for art, or is that not how it would work? How, how is this, pro and I know we're just, this would be just voting on a wall, we're not talking about art, but the design of the wall, if we're going to have some piece of art attached or whatever, that design of the wall is going to have to be done in such a way to make that piece of art work. So what, what are we looking at for a process? <clears throat> Again, uh, the contract uh, before the council will be on March 5th is for the design uh, of a fix to the wall. And certainly our, our intention, I believe it's the council's intention, is to incorporate uh, the historic uh, art that's been there and trying to incorporate that into the final product that we ultimately put up. What Robbie's job will be uh, and Emmy's job will be is to try to design it so that we can best incorporate the art into the project. Uh, we don't know what that looks like. They've not started design. They've not evaluated uh, all those different options. But to the extent that we can, uh, that's what we're intending to do. And But again, we don't have the answers to those questions yet. But uh, ultimately, that may end up in a call for art. But at this point, we don't know whether it would require a call for art. Uh, there are processes associated with, with that. Uh, if we're going to do a call for art uh, that uh, uh, Russ and his team do, uh, but there also may be other options for us, too, that we haven't yet considered. So uh, the, the, the options are wide open at this point, and we're just going to um, work with Porter uh, and, and get his feedback on how we can go about uh, making, it, making the best situation we can uh, out of what's currently there. So could a call for art be... I mean, it's sort, of, it's sort of like an RFP. Could, could it be very specific in that, I, and I'm not saying how it should be or what it should be, but just as an example, could it say something like, you must use these materials or it must recreate what was there? Or I, I mean, do you have latitude in terms of framing up ex what is 
going to have to be done? And would that be something that you would try to work with the artist and what was there? I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm really not the call for art expert, so if Mike or Russ I mean, would be able Russ, to address that, that would probably be best. Okay, that would be great. Good afternoon, Mike Cooper. I'm getting all choked up talking about art. Excuse me, Mike Cooper, Planning and Development Services. The answer is yes, we can, we can structure a call for art just like an RFP. You can, very, you can make it very specific as far as intent, materials, theme, whatever you might want to do. And uh, as we've met before, and we've met with Porter, uh, and we've talked about this process, we're still looking at what those options are, whether we have to do a formal call for art, if we can incorporate his work in another fashion. So, but we do have options available that we can basically say it, it has to incorporate as many elements of the original wall as possible. We do have that potential, yes. Okay, and I, I, I guess I would say it needs to be structurally sound first, yep. and then from there, I, I guess, I'm not sure which way we're going, because again, I, there wasn't really, I mean, there, was, there really wasn't a vote as to what we were looking to do, and I think that's where some of the struggle is, because I don't know that any of us are completely clear of where we're going with this. And then just to throw out, there's also gonna be, we may run into things like bid laws, and uh, the fact that the city does own all of this, and, and so it, there's, there's issues that may come up as we work through this that may make it challenging and that's why I think you can't answer some of those questions because some of those things we have to determine yet and we may not have all the answers. And some of those will be fleshed out as you work through a design as well. Okay, thanks. I'm going to open it up for public input and then we'll come back to the council. I have to have public input so if there's anybody that would like to address any of the two presentations from fire code updates to the final design construction of this please come forward uh, after uh, there are no more public inputters we will then turn it back over to the council uh, to wrap up very, very soon. Bruce Danielson. I've read the reports that have been, uh, the two of them, both the contract and the, and the report. There's a, one part of the whole process that's missing from the packet, and that's the geotech report. Uh, I was looking at the construction of this, I actually even went down into the pit and helped get some of the stone that went into this wall all those years ago. So I kind of followed all along. And one of the things that was put in to the geotech portion of the consultant's report is saying that there's only a two inch base of what's called manufactured stone or select underneath this. There's actually between a five and six foot trench that was dug and filled with select to form a frost proof footing under this wall. That wall was designed to stand for a thousand years. Sure, there was some issues with some, some rock that uh, may have been the wrong choice to use for one of the designs, may have caused part of the, the problem. But when you look at how this wall was built all those years ago, it's done a pretty darn good job standing. And I have actually had to call the police on different occasions to have people taken off the wall. People that were on top of that wall, taking pieces of it apart, throwing it down, going up there, throwing rocks off the top at cars going by. And I've called the police to get people off there. There was nothing the Parks Department ever did in all of these years to stop people from crawling on that wall or doing anything, even a signage to say, it's dangerous to walk on this wall, or this is a piece of art. This Parks Department has only considered this as a pile of rubble. And that's all I've ever heard from different people in this Parks Department, because it's never been light. And I've been very insulted, and I have been feeling very insulted on behalf of the artists that created it. And to go through and read the reports that have been published about this wall, and the comments that have been made about this wall should insult even this body. Because this is art. One of the problems we have in Sioux Falls continually, going back into the 1960s and 70s, 
with the urban renewal and everything else was the pride that people took in this town of tearing things down instead of building it up or restoring it or keeping it alive. This is another one of those situations where this body, if this contract is allowed to go through anywhere close to what's in it, we're looking at replacing art with a bunch of concrete that's just going to fall apart. Look at all of the monster block walls. Look, look at the, all the keystone walls that are in this town and see what happens as soon as a little bit of the street chemicals get on it. As the wear and tear happens, they're not going to last 20 years. They're not going to, a lot of them aren't even lasting 10 years if you look at the walls along Cliff Avenue. We need to do something here. That quartzite is never going to fall apart. That 160 foot long trench that was put in to make a, an incredible frost footing is going to hold. When I was wandering through Europe 35 years ago, one of the things I really enjoyed doing, and I know it sounds nerdy, but I studied stone walls over there because I just loved the Appian Way. I loved walking the roads in Ireland and seeing the stacked stone walls that were over there that have lasted since my great-grandparents and their parents lived in Ireland. The stone walls all through Europe have held because they knew what they were doing. When I was watching Porter and Chris build this wall and I was involved in some of that work, I saw what they were doing. I have built a significant number of stone walls based on these concepts, and they haven't moved an inch. I haven't seen anything in this wall that shows that any part of it has been a failure except maybe the choice of one particular stone that may have caused a, a failure. There were things that were put into the report talking about different materials that were used in this wall. I would really love to know what those materials, they say plastic was used. No, they were using the geotech style to hold this wall together and keep anything from leaching through. There's a whole series of things wrong with this report, and I believe this report should be thrown away and a new one created. Thank you. Any other public input? We'll turn it over to the counselor. Thank you, Mike, for coming back up. Would you like I think to this was public input, but yeah. I just wanted to, again, uh, Mike Cooper, Planning Development Services. Uh, a while back, Butch Warrington, our chief building official, went through with you some upcoming building code amendments, and one of those also addressed the six-unit buildings were for sprinklers for new construction only. And I just want to remind you that at the end of that presentation, we had a representative of both the home builders and multi-housing get up and indicate that they were aware of these changes and they were not going to be concerned about them. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Appreciate it. Um, Council, we have about three minutes is pushing it, but um, before our next meeting starts at five uh, to allow the um, technology to catch up. Uh, anybody else have questions for staff or comments? Councilor Staley, is that you? That's me. Okay. So back to this wall issue. First of all, I'm going to ask that in consideration to Porter Williams in the future, if there's a meeting, that somebody from your department could notify him. Sure, we, absolutely. Oh, okay, that's yep. consideration. And then I'm not quite sure legally or how this looks as far as how we could work this so that he gets worked into the contract. And, and I've heard it thrown out that if we call this a repair versus a reconstruction, then if, it, if we were repairing this, then he would be involved. Correct. Uh, we wouldn't yeah, have we've to have hired a, all right, a repair all right. in the past. Yeah. We so is there some way? And and I think the mayor's office is maybe working on this a little bit too. But I think from what I'm hearing from the public that they want him mixed into the to the batter. We want him to be part of the process. So however that looks, when you say there's a possibility to put this out for other artistic proposals, to me that kind of sounds kind of. Uh, eerie that, I mean, it, it could, the door could slam shut on him and then stranger things have happened where all of a sudden now we're bringing in, uh, what's that company we use a lot? They do a lot of landscaping for the park department. What's that, what's it called? 
Well, there's a variety of landscape architects firms that but we the do. ones we use a lot. Um, uh, Confluence, Stockwell. Yes, they, they, they would yeah. somehow be designing it. You know, that would be unfortunate for him. So I, I'm just, I, I'm not sure where we can go legally to say, can we inject his name into the contract or do we, what can we do with that? And I think as a body here, we have a, we have a right to, we're voting on this and we're setting policy and so. What I can tell you is that we'll, we'll explore all those options and we'll work with our legal and finance teams and um, explore all those options. Okay, thank you. But. Councilor Brecky, I'll be fast, but yeah, if you could just explore the option, I don't know that it's prob probably viable to have him actually remove it himself, but maybe, and maybe it is, maybe it could be done through a separate contract, you know, a separate repair contract. But even if not that, if there's some way he could be present and maybe supervise the renewal, um, the removal process, just that would make it so much more helpful for him, you know, in reconstructing it if that's done well. And so I just toss that out for your consideration as well. There's ways to incorporate him into that process so that he's not, um, so it doesn't get so expensive, you know, um, when he has to put it back together. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, we will adjourn this meeting and we have our joint city county meeting to follow at five o'clock. <laughs>